I hope everyone out there can hear me. My name is Tammy and I'm from Goldfields Libraries, coming to you from Maiden Gully, my home office tonight. Um, I'm living on Zsa, Zsa Wurrung country and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, our guest presenter tonight is Craig Castry, who has over 45 years experience as a horticulturalist, <clears throat> excuse me, and more importantly, uh, having growing his own food in his own urban backyard. Um, so he's a big advocate for that. And I think in this day and age, it's something that we all want to do. Um, so I think we'll have a great night with Craig. Uh, so sit back and enjoy. If you have any questions, please feel free to put them on the chat as we go along. Craig will be keeping a check on that. Um, if you could keep muted, that would be appreciated as well. So welcome, Craig, and I'm handing over to you. Thank you very much, Tammy, and welcome, uh, everyone. I, I, I'm really pleased to be here. And, of course, tonight we're talking about Edible Garden. So it's my hope tonight that um, by the time that we finish this presentation, you might think a little bit differently about um, how you or, or, or where you grow food. And uh, look, I've, I've, as Timmy says, I've, uh, I've been growing my own food now for well over 45 years, no matter where I've lived, whether it be a rented place or places that I'm buying or paying off. Um, and, and now I reside in Werribee on a 500 square metre block. So my my uh, my parcel of land is quite small. My the house leaves a big footprint on the land, like most of our blocks these days do. We're living in much smaller spaces, and um, you'd be surprised at just how much you can grow. So, which I'll, I'll move through. So, I'm also the president of the Werribee Park Heritage Orchard down at the mansion here, and uh, I lead a group of volunteers each Friday when we can go there, um, uh, restoring a wonderful old fruit heritage fruit tree orchard down there. So. Uh, uh, you might look us up on online, uh, or if you're ever down that way on a Friday, call in and see us uh, between 9 and 12.30. So without further ado, um, I think most people these days don't think they've got a great deal of, of room to grow uh, food. And I think most of us look at, you know, potentially putting in a vegetable patch. Well, I want you to try and stop thinking about vegetable patches. I think that they get most people into a, a great heap of trouble. We, we all of a sudden become farmers when we talk about vegetable patches and we grow rows of this and rows of that, uh, all in the same place, mainly all out in the full sun, and, and often that's the wrong place. So, again, I, I, this is all really going to be about um, a bit of a, a change in how we, we've, we've looked at growing food. Um, and, and like this, I'm, in, I'm not really in an estate, but I'm, I'm in a similar sort of scenario where we're all on top of one another. And, and I use the front yard and the backyard as a place to grow food. Now, um, my gardens don't look like a vegetable garden and I want to try and encourage people from the outset not to grow food like this because ultimately what happens is you put everything in competition with one another, um, particularly the same uh, plants, you know, rows of this and rows of that. The, the other thing that happens is that you instantly are uh, attracting in insects and pests and disease. You know, they've got fairly poor eyesight and they recognise things by leaf shape. So I can guarantee you if you put in a row of cabbage or broccoli, the cabbage white butterfly is going to find it and it's going to lay its eggs and you're going to get eaten out of house and home. So edible gardening is done very, very differently and it's not like this. This is farming. It's hard work. You've got to work the soil heavily. You've got to continually uh, replace, or replenish the nutrients that these um, rows of plants that are taking at the same nutrients, you know, the same, same spot year after year, or you've got to start and worry about crop rotation and, you know, no one's got the time for it. And, and farming is hard work. Ask the farmers, they'll tell you. You know, there's a much easier way. And I want to show you that tonight. You know, this is edible gardening. And, and, and at the outset, you can see all of a sudden that there's no rows. Um, there's lots and lots of diversity in this. And let me zoom in a little bit so I can sort of pick out some things here so you can see a bit clearer. You can see that the uh, on the, on the right-hand side of the, the garden bed at the end, <clears throat> I've got a couple of different varieties of marigolds in between some different varieties of lettuce. Uh, now, the marigolds are a wonderful plant because they actually help attract in predatory insects and pollinating insects. Um, the, the leaves actually help repel some of the um, pest insects, things like white fly and thrips. 
Um, but, but as you can see in amongst there, I'm growing those little dainty white flowers just underneath the tomatoes there. Um, that's um, chamomile um, tomatoes. Uh, then the red stem plant, that, that's a beetroot. And, and there's some more lettuce in amongst. There's also some spring onions as you move along. There's a pumpkin spilling out onto the path. Um, there's there's that, that dainty little white flower at the far end on the left-hand side. That's fever few. There's some spring onions in there. There's also some white violas and pansies in amongst. There's even some blue flowering lobelia. So you can see that there's quite a diversity going on in here. In fact, over the, uh, the mesh at the back there, there's some scarlet runner beans. So edible gardening is all about basically food foresting your garden. It's about building a, a, its own ecosystem. Instead of planting things of the same uh, variety or species together, you know, taking out all those nutrients and attracting the insects and pests. It's about surrounding things with other plants to help one another repel or attract pollinators, repel the predator, the, the pests, uh, et cetera, or, or bring in things like ladybird beetles or, or uh, you know, some of the predatory insects. So it's a very different way of growing uh, food. And, um, you know, even raised beds like this and, and sort of, you know, putting multiple things together. This is still farming, and this is this is still going to attract in the pests and the disease. Um, you know, the bok choy is going to get eaten out of house and home, as is the the kale in the next bed in the middle, uh, with a white cabbage moth for sure. You know, so <clears throat> um, so as I say, by the time this is finished, I'm sure you'll get a much better idea of of how to progress. Now, this is an edible garden. And they don't need to necessarily look like a vegetable garden, as you're starting to discover, no doubt. Um, let me point out some of the things that are in this picture that are edible now. Um, the centre of the screen, you can start and see that little uh, lime green board with those uh, plants uh, at the back of that. That's capsicums. And below those are Hungarian peppers. That yellow flower to its right, um, that's echinacea. Um, in the big tubs, is a fig tree um, growing up over the teepees of tomatoes. And then there's some beans off to the arbor on the right-hand side and the, the entryway, uh, there's beans growing over that. Um, it's, it's quite remarkable and different way of growing food. And scattered all the way throughout this, there are all sorts of different edible plants. It's a shame I can't zoom right in on some of these. There's things like wasabi, um, pineapple sage in between the two red flowering days. Um, that ferny looking plant behind the pineapple sage, that's a uh, passion fruit marigold. You know, so there's, this is what I'm trying to say, this is the front yard of, of the entryway of the house. You know, so, you know, look, we pay a fortune for our blocks of land and, and most of us don't use our front yards at all. It's generally there for someone else. Well, looks, uh, not for me, I, I have a completely different type of front yard. So. Speaking of which, this is me 10, 12 years ago when I first started, we shifted in, we built the place where we are. It's a very small front yard. Um, you know, if you've got a blank canvas, you're starting out, don't go racing out, spending a fortune on large established plants because what will happen is you'll plant them in the ground and, and they'll sit there and mark time for 12 months before they start to break out of that, that, uh, that pot scenario that they've been in. I'd much rather you went out and, and, and bought what you needed, nice and small, tube stock is ideal. Um, I'm going to zoom in here. These, these are cuttings that I've taken of rosemary that are lining the path. I, I intended to grow a rosemary hedge around the, uh, the entryway. And on the opposite side, because I'm a beekeeper, I've got um, some lavender. And then there's some small young fruit trees that I've got dotted along the way and, and so on. Now, this next, this next photo is six months on. And as you can see, um, remarkably, it's grown quite quickly because of that very fact I started small. The plants get going fast in the ground. They adapt very quickly. They haven't had that root bound scenario in a pot where they've sat there for you know 12 months or 18 months with the, with the plants becoming root bound. These young tube stock plants get going very, very quickly in the ground. Um, so as you can see, in, in the, it hasn't taken very long. Look, those rosemaries, they would have probably cost 20 to $25 in an eight inch pot for that size plant. Um, and if I had purchased them at that size way back when I started six months earlier, 
they would still be this size in 12 months' time, whereas these would be twice that size because I've grown them from cuttings in small tubes. So it just goes to show you, you can be penny wise and pound foolish to coin a phrase, you know, spending a lot of money thinking that you're going to get great value and you actually don't get value at all. Um, and it takes an eternity for the things to, to take off. And of course, gardens are forever evolving. And there's that same front yard, some 10, 12 years on, as you can see, uh, rosemary hedge on the left-hand side and the lavender hedge on the right, um, which had just been freshly clipped when I'd taken that photo. And normally, uh, the lavender hedge as it is right now is in full bloom, absolutely full of bees coming and going, which is great. Um, and the front yard is full of apple trees that you'll note that I only let get as high as I can stand uh, reaching or as, as high as I can reach standing flat footed. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, far end of the garden pumpkins, the tomato coming up out of uh, the compost that we put out there. Just to give you an idea that that, uh, that tomato I'd never planted, it was a volunteer. And uh, my wife came running in one day and she said, do you realise you've got a tomato growing up near where those pumpkins are on the front, uh, near the front uh, front yard? And I said, yeah, I do. She said, you should pull it out. I said, why, why would I do that? She said, if someone's going you know, to pinch the tomatoes or no one grows tomatoes in the front yard. I said, well, it, it, look, if I pull it out, there's a, a weed will grow in its place. So just let's leave it there and see what happens. So I never watered it, stake it, fed it. I didn't do anything to it. I just left it to its own resources. About um, about three months or maybe a bit less uh, down the track, I asked my wife to come out and give me a hand. We picked 95 tomatoes off that one plant and no one seemingly had taken any tomatoes and they would have been welcome if they had. So um, it, it just goes to show you, you don't necessarily need to have a, uh, a vegetable garden to, to grow food. Um, again, as I say, that's a bit more of a, a look at the, uh, the front yard olive tree to the left. Uh, a gala apple tree to the right being netted, um, etc. So, moving on, this is some of the backyard. And um, regardless of how big or small your garden is, there is always room to be able to grow food, I believe. Um, I'm going to zoom in because I've got quite a lot of fruit trees. And as I say, it's only a 500 square metre block. So, what I've done is I've utilised the vertical space against the fence with fruit trees and I've espaded them by putting them on frames. And this looks complex, but they're not. They're very easy to do, much easier than growing um, fruit trees in the open vase or wine glass shape, which I'll talk about a little bit at length um, shortly. So uh, that happens to be a plum tree. And to the right, there's an, an apple tree just past the pots there. You can see some arches that add a little bit of interest in a small garden to get some depth and some, some, um, some structure to the garden and, uh, and so on. But you can see there's no cropping as such going on. That pretty little red scarlet runner bean. Uh, and a few years on down the track, as, uh, as we've uh, grown, as I say, the garden is an uh, ever evolving garden. But it's most important when you start to, to start growing food is to start to attract in these beneficial insects. You know, I often say a garden that's, that, that's buzzing is a very healthy garden. The insects coming and going, doing their thing, you know, predators. Uh, you'll get the pests, unfortunately, but bear in mind there are no pests in nature and uh, I don't spray anything in any of my garden. So um, the question here is, do you take the soil out to start and scrape off the grass? How do you suggest to start the current lawn? Okay, so um, no, I didn't take out the soil. And uh, if, if you've got lawn uh, or, you know, you've got a blank canvas that has got grass or weeds and so forth, um, there, there's a great way of being able to do it. You do need to cut it down as low as you possibly can but then lay cardboard over the top of it and then maybe get yourself some straw bales. Straw bale gardening is a great way of being able to do that and plant out the bales with little pockets of soil. And um, you, you, that way you can instantly start and grow. And what will happen is over time, the composting insects will come up through the earth because you've got that cardboard over the top of it and it'll stay nice and moist and cool. And the, the, the composting insects, things like worms, millipedes, centipedes, slaters, all of those things, they'll come up and they'll eat through the cardboard and start to slowly but surely eat away at the straw as it decomposes. And you'll continually plant out those bales and you'll, you'll be shocked at the sort of soil that those bales of straw uh, will produce. It's, it's incredible. Uh, I wouldn't use grass hay because quite often you've got a lot of seed in there. Uh, you would be better off with straw, to be honest, unless you can guarantee the grass hay you're getting is not got lots of seed in it because you don't want to 
get rid of one problem and start another. So, um, but anyway, look, that's that's uh, that's one way. The other way would be to scrape the top of it off, or or and I don't again, I hate using poison, so I wouldn't use something like a glyphosate or anything like that. I would much rather see uh, you, you, you use something like that method. Um, but as you can see, there are lots and lots of little rockery plants that I put in, um, attract, hoping to attract in lots of pollinating insects because I've got lots of uh, fruit trees and so forth. Um, you know, there's there's lots and lots of um, of these sorts of plants. This is um, a nemesia, this pink flowering plant. Uh, but as you can see, it, I often grow a lot of stuff in pots as well, and you can't or you don't always get um, it right. One, one of my cat's cries is what goes well on the plate together goes well in the ground together. So when I plant tomatoes, for instance, I always plant them with basil and garlic because they go really, really well on the plate together. They actually have a bit of a relationship in the ground together as well. So they actually help one another grow better, more flavoursome, and they help, uh, you know, um, attract pollinators and the, and the like. So I also make sure I always put a marigold in that group as well, which I'll show you shortly. So, but the beauty in the pots is that, you know, you might have a marigold or you might have a, uh, some garlic and you, and you might may well put that or sit that beside a tomato if you've forgotten to plant those things in the ground. You might have maybe some marigolds because of their aromatic foliage and their ability to be able to repel some of those sap sucking insects, things like white fly and thrip and aphids sometimes, um, you sit that pot of marigolds beside a problem plant that's being attacked and the marigold will repel the pests, do you see? So it's a great way of being able to, you know, have some diversity, be able to, um, you know, get some solutions in your yard without having to re resort to sprays. Um, again, using space wisely, vertical space is a, a valuable resource. <clears throat> I alluded to earlier that it is only a 500 square metre block, so where do I grow strawberries? So naturally enough on the fence rather than on the ground where the snails will get to. And I take, it takes up a lot of room on the, on, on the ground or a bed. So uh, vertical pots, uh, a, a vertical array of pots, half pots in this case, they're pretty cheap. You can get them online or um, at those $2 shops. They tell lies they're $3, but um, you could put uh, an irrigation pipe over the top. And if you'll allow me to zoom in again, you can see a little black pipe that goes down off the, 12 mil pipe into the top and it has a little um, gadget called a dribbler and the dribblers are there to uh, they've got a little port at the bottom of them that you can uh, wind in and wind out again and that actually adjusts uh, and lets out more or less water and they flood fill the top pot and then the drainage holes below the the top pots obviously fill out into the bottom so they're strategically placed one underneath the other but that could quite easily just as be um, it could be lettuce it could be spinach, it could be bok choy or choy sum or any of those sorts of things um, quite easily would grow in those half pots without any problem. I think a lot of people get bogged down to the fact that, you know, their soil's terrible. Why would I bother trying to grow stuff? You'd be surprised at what will grow there. Tammy was referring to the fact that her soil's very poor just before the presentation tonight, and yet she's able to grow tomatoes really well. You know, it's, it, that's fact. A lot of, you don't have to have really rich soil to grow you know, good produce, it's not, that's not the case. And if you feed from above, feed the soil from above with um, good organic fertilizers, pelletized manures and the like, just like a forest floor, that's how forest is fed, it's fed from the top, not from below. So uh, I don't work my soil, working soil is hard work. Um, and, it, and it chops up all of the vital micro flora and, and all of the good stuff that's going on in the ground. The, the, the soil is its own ecosystem. And uh, working it is a counterproductive thing to do, to be honest. Um, the farmers have to do that because they're feeding us. They have no choice. But uh, when you don't have to do that, why would you bother? Um, as you can see here, growing things quite close together um, actually shuts out weeds. So a very dense garden grows no weeds. So as you can see, there's a red lettuce, green lettuce, and there's a strawberry and a bit of marigold in the, in the, the background. And there's some dwarf beans beneath. You can see some basil plants there and some uh, remains of uh, the, the either spring onions or garlic. Um, you can see a, a nice big tomato over the back. Then there's a zucchini. You know, that's a lot of food in a very small area. That might only be about 1.5 metres square. 
So it's remarkable how much you can grow in a very small space. And as I say, I, I, I just if there's if I can see soil or or, or uh, mulch, there's a spot for another plant. So and that might be, it doesn't necessarily have to be the same plant as what's next to it, you know. And that's why I say that. Um, yeah, the question is, do you you use soil improvers? Um, no, I haven't. Um, I haven't bothered with anything like gypsums or limes or. Um, I have had to test my soil a couple of times, particularly around citrus trees, because they're showing some deficiencies. But that's been um, other things. I've had to use some trace minerals or trace elements, which um, is another workshop. But um, uh, I do plant things for from um, seeds. Uh, I often buy seedlings as well. So um, I don't always grow it. In fact, uh, at this point, as you can see, even lettuce in hanging baskets, wherever I can find a spot, I'll grow food. And uh, it's quite handy, you know, keeping stuff close to near where the kitchen is. And this happens to be a pergola not far from the kitchen. So on those cold, wet days or, you know, that, that you just don't want to have to go right up the backyard to where the vegetable patch is, it makes sense to me to have food close by your back door. So what I want to do is throw out an edible garden challenge. And this is... That, um, that time of the night where I want you to take your vegetable gardener's hats off and put an edible gardening hat on. And uh, when you get the chance to go to your local nursery, go and buy half a dozen punnets of your favourite seedling. Um, you know, it might be mixed lettuce. It might be a uh, punnet of tomatoes. Make sure you get some marigolds because they're great. Um, might be broccoli, might be beetroot, whatever, whatever you eat. And when you get home, go to the lettuce get a knife and cut one single lettuce plant out of the punnet. Find a thistle in your garden, pull the thistle out with a garden trail, just simply dig a little hole, plant your, let your single lettuce, uh, backfill it with a bit of soil. Don't worry about changing soil or turning the soil over, just dig that little hole and uh, fertilise it with about a quarter of a handful of palletised manure. Put a little bit of mulch, about 25 millimetres thick of of um, sugarcane mulch, scratch it back a little bit from the ceiling so you can still see where it is. Give it a water and go inside. Now, the reason I say pull the thistle out and replace it with lettuce is that they're in the same family. So if you can grow thistles, you can grow lettuce standing on your ear. So um, it's, it's very, very simple. This only takes five minutes. Tomorrow night, or the, the night after when you get home from work, go to the next one. It might be a beetroot. Same deal. Get the knife, cut one beetroot only out. Go and find another weed. Now, wide leaf plants are shade loving plants. So things like lettuce, cabbage, collie, broccoli, um, silver beet, kale, um, e e even tomatoes. Tomatoes are vines. They grow up through the outskirts of the forest between the shrubs and the trees of others. So, you know, they don't like full sun. If you put them out in the full sun and you've got them wilting in the heat of the day, that tells me you've got them in the wrong spot. So between the shrubs, you know, underneath, beneath plants that are going to offer some shade in the afternoon is a great place to be able to put these plants, including the beetroot um, or, or broccoli or whatever that, whatever you're going to grow. So, so removing weeds. So by the time you get to the seventh day, you're going to plant your second lettuce, which means you are now going to get into this stagger, staggering of planting. Instead of if you had planted one punnet of lettuce all at once, in six weeks you will have had too much lettuce. It'll be coming out you know, your shopping baskets. So, um, so it's just so easy, seriously. So, so take up the edible garden challenge and try it. So you'll be gobsmacked in a few weeks time, just how much food you'll produce by doing this. Now I noticed that we had some questions that uh, I didn't get to, and I'll just have a quick look uh, rather than get too bogged down with them. Cause I often find that I, I tend to uh, answer a lot of what I, what I get asked along the way. Do you progressively plant continuous supply of food? Yes. You, you, I've just sort of covered that, really. Do you have any advice on getting rid of lots of oxalis? There, specialist questions. Perhaps send me an email after the uh, the meeting and I'll see what I can do about giving you some idea. This is dealing with running grass. The same deal. Uh, we grow lettuce. Yep. Okay. So, again, I'll try and reserve a bit of time at the very end. Otherwise, we won't get through all of this. This is a wicking bed. So, if you're space poor, or you're terrible at looking after gardens and think you've got a black thumb, these might be for you. <clears throat> this is a uh, repurposed uh, fruit box that's got a liner inside it. It's filled half full of stone at the bottom of it. 
It has an overflow pipe at that level, um, some geotextile fabric or doubled over shade cloth over the top of the stone, and then the rest is filled up with soil. The soil is no deeper than 30 centimetres because wicking, this is called a wicking bed, wicking, the wicking effect stops after 30 centimetres. So um, your reservoir can be nice and deep, but the, uh, the, the, the soil needs to be 30 centimetres. And there is a fill pipe in the corner, not where that, uh, just where that hose is. Well, you can't see it, it's the eggplants uh, blocking it. Um, but you just poke the hose down there and turn the hose on. And when it runs, when the water runs out of the overflow pipe, you know your reservoir is full. So you plant your seedlings in the wicking bed and you have to water them by hand for the first week. And after that, it's happy days. They get watering them. They'll water themselves. All you've got to do is intermittently, about every fortnight, check. Uh, lift the cap off the fill pipe, poke the hose down, turn it on when it fills, uh, when it runs out of the uh, the overflow pipe, you're done. So, and for the first month, you might find that you won't have to probably fill it up until about a month's time. But as the plants get bigger and bigger, obviously they use more water, and uh, the, the, the the summer heats up, you'll you'll go through more. So, but as you can see here, tomato, again the same old scenario, basil at the bottom. Um, this would be late in summer or midsummer, so garlic would have well and truly been harvested. Remember the what goes well on the plate together goes well on the ground together. But anything from the allium family, if you don't like garlic, um, will do. So leeks, chives, spring onions are okay. Marigolds, because of their ability to be able to attract in pollinators and also repel a lot of the um, insect pests. The, the wonderful thing about marigolds and tomatoes is that the root system of the tomato, uh, the root system of the marigolds repels, um, um, repels the nematodes that the tomatoes are susceptible to. Um, I'll, I'll get to the instructions on the wicking bed a bit later on. Um, just remind me, please. Um, yeah, so uh, marigolds repel the nematodes that, the, that are in the soil, my, microscopic worms. That, uh, that get stuck into the tomatoes roots. So they're also a very, very good companion for, um, for tomatoes. Uh, blue flowering lobelia, anything mauve, blue flowering or dark pink uh, will attract in things like uh, our, our Victorian blue banded bee, which absolutely love tomatoes. So it's happy days, you can get them in your backyard, which is one of the reasons why I plant lobelia and, and some of the other plants that I'll talk about shortly uh, into there because I grow tomatoes each year and of course, the European honeybee does not like tomatoes, but the blue banded bee does. And uh, you get a bumper crop if you can get them in there. So uh, there's that ring up, um, uh, garlic, tomato, basil. Uh, when I plant garlic, generally around about April, uh, March, April, uh, I always plant a ring here and a ring there where I'm going to plant tomatoes. And in the interim, while I'm waiting for the soil to, to get to the right temp before I plant tomatoes in, by the way, uh, Tomatoes, I wait for seven overnight low temperatures above uh, 10 all together in a, in, a, in, a, in a row. I mean, I know it's hard sometimes with the weather forecasters, but that's what you're looking for. Seven overnight low temperatures above 10 degrees will give you about the right temperature in the soil. Um, you can buy a soil thermometer. I, I have one. Um, you're waiting for about 18 to 20 degrees in the soil. That will tell you that. So it's not cup day. It's not grand final day. It's not derby day. It's none of those. So, um, but as I say, in, in the interim, when I'm planting garlic, I uh, plant again with what goes well on the plate together, goes well on the ground together. So things like bok choy, a lot of the Asian greens, um, you know, spinach, all of those sorts of things over winter, quick crops that um, will, uh, will allow me to get those things out. I never ever plant my tomatoes together because you instantly put them into competition for food, water and light. And if one gets a pest or a disease, they all get it. Um, they're, they're very susceptible to disease too. So it's very important that you, you learn that lesson. Um, you don't want to be like, as I say, the poor farmers so are having to um, spray and dust and do all those sorts of things. Um, whereas if you do this, if one gets a pest or a disease, you don't need to worry so much because they're not uh, next to one another. So good way to go. Um, great companion underneath apple trees is chives or anything from the allium family. Again, it keeps the godling moth away from your, uh, from your apple trees. So, you know, and if you cover the month of October, most importantly, which is when the, the, uh, the little grub emerges out of the egg and starts to climb the tree, because the sulfur emitting roots from the uh, allium family plants 
the uh, the codling moth goes away. They don't like it at all. So there's that stray straw bale method I was talking about a bit earlier. Um, if you were you know going to uh, circumnavigate a fence, you would have these butted up hard against uh, one another, and you could plant out the front of these as well as the tops. You just simply stick a garden trail into the middle and give it a bit of a wiggle, put a good quality potting mix into there, and then plant the seedling out. Obviously, don't plant all these cabbage together because that goes against the, uh, the the edible gardening scenario. You would, you know, again, remember that what goes well on the plate together goes well on the ground together. Um, I, I forgot to mention that I'm the author of three books, which I'll talk about at the end. Um, I have comprehensive lists um, of companion plants and what goes well together or not so well in the ground in my book. So um, I've got this in the mix because, again, I'm talking about the wide leaf plants. These are dwarf beans, and these are growing under the shade of a tree. Just to give you the idea um, that, you know, they're, they're very plentiful. You don't need full sun to grow um, a lot of these wider leaf plants. Unfortunately, our labelling here in Australia is not terribly good with regard to um, you know, plants that we sell retail. Um, you know, the, the, the information that they've used on these labels that come from books, that come from where these plants are native to. A lot of them in the UK and books from the UK. You know, we weren't very clever when we came into Australia. We brought our food system with us and, uh, and we brought the books with us too, just to teach us how to, to, to grow these things. But the problem is that we didn't swap um, our summer for summer. Their summers are very cool over there and our summers here are very, very hot and harsh. Our soils are poor. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a whole different ball game here. So these plants like, like the cover of some shade. You know, get them out. Of, these wider leaf plants, things like tomatoes as well, if you can get them out of the, the sun by about half past 12, one o'clock, um, you, you'll do far better, I can assure you. So um, speaking of which, this is on the south side of my house. Um, and as you can see, I've got tomatoes about 1.5 to 2 metres apart, which is what I recommend uh, generally. So as I say, when I don't say we'll plant them together, I wouldn't have them up close, separated by other plants. Generally, they're companions. So something like a uh, marigold, where there you go, the blue flowering lobelias again, um, some basil, some lettuce and so forth. So, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Uh, heaps of diversity, you know, um, as you can see, I've got some celery, I've got some um, some beetroot in the foreground and some kohlrabi there, um, chamomile, there's some garlic on the end, some, a couple of different varieties of lettuce, lobelia. I have a bit of fun with the the, uh, the borders around my garden beds, help stop the, the birds from kicking the mulch out over the, onto the path. Um, so I put a border of lettuce, but I use one red, one green, and one blue flowering lobelia, and uh, it does a great job. As you can see, a poppy that's uh, in flower, some blue flowering borage there in the on the right hand side. <laughs> there we go, uh, a bit of a look over the top. Um, one of the great things with uh, growing things like broccoli, if you grow white violas or white pansies nearby or beneath, that keeps the club, the cabbage moth away. I've tried all these other things. I've tried eggshells upturned. I've tried um, cutouts of butterflies out of ice cream container lids. Nothing seems to work, but the white violas and white pansies seem to do the trick. They are very territorial, and when they see uh, a rival, they tend to stay away. So, uh, and because these look a bit like one of them from a distance, because they've got fairly poor eyesight, as they're flying over, they spot something that looks like one of them, they fly on preferably over the back fence to someone that's got a vegetable patch full of, uh, of broccoli, cabbage or something else that might might look tasty to them. But that's the idea. Trying to, um, you know, land crest is good for keeping it away, yes. So, you know, the, the, it's all about adding diversity into uh, into the mix. You can see that there's even a, a fox club in, in amongst this. So, so yeah, anyway, um, some places that you might find in your garden uh, will lend themselves, particularly north or northwest facing brick walls, maybe an ideal spot to grow an avocado or something from the poor, poor family like this one. This is a babaco. Um, it's much bigger than that now. And uh, in fact, I'm still picking fruit because they're ripening as we speak. 
and they're delicious. They call them champagne fruit, and uh, they're about 30 centimetres long or even a bit longer, uh, some of these. Curry leaf plant beside it. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're a great thing. There's that border I was talking about, you know, saves the, uh, the mulch getting part, kicked out of the, uh, out of the garden onto the, uh, onto the path. So, and it, and it looks pretty. And the other thing too is that when I want to go and pick a salad, I'm only picking a few leaves off each plant. I'll leave my border in place. I tend to use non-harting type uh, varieties and um, I'm continually planting, you know, every day I'm putting something, a couple of plants, I'm, you know, with a garden challenge, the edible garden challenge, I'm saying plant one thing, but you knock yourself out. If you want to plant two or three things per day, great. But uh, just don't go planting everything all at once because that generally gets people into the uh, into a lot of trouble, and you become you've got to get into this habit of planting quite often. So each week I plant some new seeds or something, and I do try and let some things go to seed. There's the babaco now, as you can see, um, quite uh, quite established, grows to about two meters, maybe two point four meters tops, but um, yeah, nothing to have thirty or forty of these fruit hanging down. Uh, on the plant, so yeah, fantastic. Now, um, nasturtiums are an, another wonderful plant to have in amongst your garden. They also, you can grow these beneath apple trees to help not only shade the soil a little, keep it cooler, but also to ward off the coddling moth. The coddling moth don't like these at all. So uh, be careful though that some of these can get a little bit unruly. So perhaps look for the smaller clumping types. Completely edible leaves, flowers, and seeds. Seeds you can make a poor man's uh caper with those you can pickle them they're delicious mind you you wouldn't need a whole salad of uh of those leaves because they're pretty peppery uh nasturtiums are there they are called they come in an array of different colors this is echinacea this is a wonderful perennial plant that dies down and comes back up each year bees absolutely love it flowers very very well uh grows to about 1.2 meters tall um it comes in three different colors i showed you one in the uh that that uh, lovely little uh picturesque edible garden initially um they, the yellows whites and this lovely candy pink uh, flower for a long period of time they start to flower around about uh, mid-november and they're probably still flowering around about the end of march early early april so yeah they flower pretty well this is borage this is a fantastic plant for uh, attracting in european honeybees they love it of course if you've got fruit trees and you're wanting to uh, to get good pollination uh, the key to success is to make sure that you're planting plenty of things in your garden that are attracting in these bees so that while they're there, they'll be kind enough to come and help you out with your, your fruit trees. Uh, the flowers on these are also edible and quite often they, I see uh, people candy these flowers and they decorate cakes with them and so on. And um, the uh, leaves, they, they taste a little bit like uh, cucumber as a matter of fact. And the younger leaves are also very edible. Um, as they get a bit older, though, they are a bit prickly, the, uh, the leaves, as you can see by the, the buds, but uh, they're quite soft, yeah, but quite tasty. This is a blue flowering salvia. This is another great one for an edible garden. Uh, again, attracting in lots of the predatory insects uh, and, and pollinators, particularly blue banded bee is one of those that loves the blue flowering salvia. Again, in the colder regions, these will die down and come back up. Um, but if you can overwinter them, they, uh, they get, you know, a decent sort of size, you know, up around about two to three feet tall, if, uh, but and, and respond very well to cutting back to. Um, there's our mate, the blue banded bee in a pink flowering nemesia. I always make sure I've got nemesias nearby my tomatoes as well. Sometimes I'll grow those in pots. So I'll sit the pot near the tomato so that uh, I'll get these guys uh, nearby. So, um, yeah, fantastic little bee. In fact, um, you'll hear them before you see them. They're quite uh, loud. They're a, a buzz pollinator. They're a bit like the bumblebee down in Tasmania. Um, so they, they pollinate flowers very differently than the, the, uh, the normal honey bee. They don't make any honey as such. And they come in pairs. Uh, generally, they don't come in, in, um, in uh, you know, in, in quanti quantity. You won't see heaps and heaps of them all at once. You, you may only see one or two, and at best, generally the male and the female, they travel in pairs. Um, the male has five bands on its abdomen, and the female has four. Uh, you know, 
apple flower, so pretty little bee, very hairy, and uh, quite often you'll you'll see them nearly in the yeah in, in, covered in pollen. Incredible. <clears throat> On a tomato, they're uh, they're fantastic because they uh, they negatively charge themselves and. And the pollen on the tomato is positively charged, so they're like a magnet, nearly, and they go from flower to flower to flower. So it's it's worth trying to get them in. This is a perennial called uh, passion fruit marigold. Taggarty's Lamonii is the uh, the botanical name for it, often called the um, giant marigold. Um, giant by the fact that it would grow about 1.2 meters in the ground. I often grow this in pots because um, it, it has a heady aroma of of, uh, of passion fruit, hence the nickname passion fruit marigold, um, either after it's rained or if you brush up against it. So the foliage is extremely aromatic, um, just like uh, it's its cousin, the normal marigold. And um, it repels at quite a lot of the flying troublesome insects that are hard to get rid of. So this is a must for pots, They're easy to grow from cutting and seed. So uh, look that one up. This is uh, fever few. It's a great little plant. It's a small rockery type plant. Um, not, it's not edible, but um, you can make a tincture from these, these things. It's more of a medicinal plant, but because of the nature of this plant, um, it attracts in quite a lot of beneficial insects. Things like um, lace wings, uh, hoverflies, ladybird beetles. So they're, uh, they're all good predators, which is uh, important. There's our little mate again at a tomato flower. It took me a long time to get these, some of these shots, let me tell you. Um, blue banded blue at the tomato flower. So as you can see, it's a valuable asset to have in the garden if you can get it. So uh, try and make sure you plant those mauve blue uh, flowering plants. Um, our mate, the poppy before, again, as I say, uh, brilliant colors, very different, but in an edible garden beneath, below it are a couple of lettuce. Uh, and of course, in amongst this chamomile. So um, if you happen to see these guys, these little hairs with these faint little eggs on the end, um, rejoice because uh, these are lacewing eggs and uh, it's, they're a fantastic predator. Here's the, the lacewing adult. Uh, and by the way, insects that are generally this color are generally 99.9% .9 of them are good guys. So look after them. Um, these guys are voracious feeders of all sorts of larvae <clears throat> including aphids. Excuse me, dry work, just talking. Now, it's one thing to attract all of these insects into your garden. It's another thing to make them resident. So you might like to consider making yourself an insect hotel. I know people call these bee hotels, but I've yet to see any of our native bees down here in Victoria, of which we only have four uh, out of about the 1,360-odd that uh, are in Australia. So south of the divide because it's a bit cold, we only get four, uh, and none of them really would take up residence in anything like this, but there are plenty of those other types of insects that will, and uh, if you can get them to become resident in your backyard, and uh, you know when you get a pest, you've got, you, you've got some, um, some cavalry on your side, basically. You, you've got some predators to, to take up uh, the charge in the garden. So, uh, and you can buy these, you don't have to necessarily make them, as you can see, these are old used uh, bamboo stakes I've collected from nurseries as uh, as I go in there quite often, they'll, they'll take out the old ones and replace them with new ones because the old ones will make the plant look tired. So might, might, maybe you might ask your uh, your local nursery if they've got any that um, can take off their, their hands. Um, habitat's another thing that I often uh, consider too, is a small birdhouse uh, is very important. Uh, as you can see, the exposure trees in the background um, are netted by now. No nets equals no fruit. By the way, netting laws have changed on the 1st of September. You can no longer use this aperture size net. It needs to be less than five millimetres square at full stretch, and they need to be stretch nets. So, but, uh, and I'll replace these. I can't use these nets now. Uh, I have new ones on the way. But I use, this is, this is the ideal part about exposure and keeping them as high as the, the fence. I can use the top of the fence to put my nets to. I pull them up over the top of the trees, down into the ground, tent peg them at the bottom, and it's game over for the birds. And I just simply undo the tent pegs and roll them up, clip them back up, uh, or hang them on the trees while I'm picking fruit, and uh, roll them back down again. So they're very, very easy. 
by the way, you might notice on the right hand side of the, the birdhouse just beneath is uh, rhubarb and uh, rhubarb and apple on the plate go well together. So they go well in the ground together. So there's that same scenario again. Now there are some plants from time to time that need to be grown in groups. Things like corn should be grown together um, because they're wind pollinated and corn's a nitrogen hog. So what you do with corn is you wait until it gets to about knee high and then you plant beans or peas around the outside of it because nitrogen grows on the roots of bees and peas, uh, bean, beans and peas. And it gives back the nitrogen that the corn takes out. And of course, it, the corn provides something for them to grow over. So you don't have to worry about putting a trellis in. And of course, on the plate together, they go really, really well. So uh, not rocket science. Fruit trees, most people don't put in near enough fruit trees, I don't believe. I think they're frightened that trees these days might get into uh, lift up their their uh, foundations, get into pipes and so forth. Look, most fruit trees these days are on dwarfing rootstocks, which means they don't have a tap root. They're safe to use. And um, this is a gala apple, as I say. This is now about uh, nine years old. That's as big as it will ever get. Um, it produces an amazing amount of fruit, as you can see. No nets equals no fruit. Um, pumpkin out the front, some time below it. Um, what can I say? It's uh, it's uh, very highly productive, and uh, again, once you uh, you learn this, uh, the better you you, uh, you become at it. So um, I let a lot of stuff go to seed. I collect my own seeds where I possibly can. That helps me build genetics in my own seeds. The seeds become accustomed to my rainfall, my climate, my soil pH, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, and they often get better, bigger yields year after year. So this is a carrot that I'm letting go to flower. Uh, I only let one go to flower because the carrot flower is a floret and they produce thousands of seeds. And uh, as you can see, out of one carrot, I've got lots and lots of heads and they'll get twice the size of this yet. And uh, they'll often attract in things like lace wings and praying mantis love with this. So um, yeah, it's happy days. Uh, of course, the other thing too with uh, fruit trees, particularly keeping them down low, you know, up to about two metres, Will help shade some of those hot west or northwest facing windows or walls, particularly if you're going to use something like an espalier tree that shades out the hot summer sun uh, over the warmer months. And when it drops its leaves, and it just drops once, unlike native trees that drop all the time, you get to use the leaves in the compost and you get the warm winter sun back in to warm up the house. And uh, you might help save some of your heating and cooling costs if you consider using these uh, appropriately and and, uh, and and carefully. So as I say, blocking out the sun, obviously not a big tree like this, but I'm talking about the smaller two metre growers, you know, the spiders and the like. So um, open vase shaped plants, I talked about these, you know, great lawn specimens and so forth, you know, in the front yard or the backyard. But at the end of the day, when I pass someone a pair of second thirds and say, here go prune this, people scratch their head and think I'm not sure where to cut. Whereas this method, a spidering, is very easy. You put a stake three metres apart and a timber top on the top of it, belt those into the ground. Uh, at knee height, you put in a wire, 30 centimetres each wire until you get to the top, plant the tree in the middle, um, prune off the branches that don't lend itself to the shape you want to grow it. So anything that grows toward the fence, you cut off. Anything that grows towards you, you cut off. And those that match the wires, you just train those along. And when they hit the post either side, you prune those back. When they start to grow uh, uprights off the, the uh, uh, off the uh, the lateral branches, you simply like this. You simply cut those off. Very very simple. So it, it, it's so easy. It's not funny to grow something like this on uh, on a frame. And because they're lateral, they tend to produce more fruit. <clears throat> this is an apple tree in my backyard, which I've grafted. Uh, this, this tree actually has 12 different varieties on it. Um, so as you can see, it's varying stages of, uh, of flowering and uh, early, mid and late varieties I've got on this. So I start picking some apples in uh, January and I'm still picking fruit off that uh, Witcher Granny Smith, I think, uh, in about the first week of July. So I nearly get seven months worth of apples out of this one tree. 
and uh, I never get sick of the fruit that's uh, that's on it. Um, and we get to pick, you know, about 20 to 25 pieces of fruit uh, throughout the year. Um, you know, so we, uh, yeah, that, that's just a way, great way of being able to utilise space. By the way, if you're going to consider putting your spiders in, um, make sure you don't put them right against the fence. Give them some room because eventually if you've got a timber fence like I have, that will have to be replaced and uh, you need some room to be able to have that happen. Uh, as you can see, here's some apples on that tree, varying stages of ripeness of the different varieties. Uh, the front red ones are Arcane, which is a wonderful uh, Japanese uh, apple. Uh, the green ones here are Mutsu. Uh, these are Kingston Black up the top. Uh, other side, I think, uh, Opalescent. No, there's all sorts. So, but you get the idea. And as I say, over time, they take about six to seven months to uh, to pick. That actually faces, uh, that gets about sun from about 12 o'clock until about seven o'clock, I suppose. So I get about six to seven hours of sun. So um, uh, this gets less sun than that. And it's sort of facing, uh, the end of it's facing north. So it sort of it gets a mix of of uh, early morning sun and late afternoon. That's the plum. Uh, boy, we get a lot of fruit off this too. So um, this is called a step over. Imagine lining your uh, front uh, path of the house with, uh, you know, this, this happens to be a pink lady apple that's only knee high on a dwarfing rootstock, uh, just grown on a single wire. Um, you know, it might be your fence between you and your neighbour. How good would that be? So it's it's remarkable what you can do with the spidering when you know how. Um, <clears throat> uh, against the, the north facing brick, uh, wall, it might be too hot. But if you come off it, you know, a couple of feet, that would be okay. If you come up at 60 centimetres, that, that would be all right. Uh, this is a pair, as you can see. The frame is the same as the one I explained before. Frames don't have to change depending upon the shape. You just simply tie off the branches as to where you want them. And as you can see, the framework branches, which are the thicker branches that, that, that take up the shape, all of the fruiting timber is very quite close, closely kept to the framework branches, which is really a good lesson for all of us. Regardless of how you grow your fruit trees, that's where your fruit wood should be. You pick out your framework branches and keep all of your fruit wood branches reasonably close so that they are able to hold quite a lot of the fruit. So um, even grown over an arch, um, these are many trees obviously, but uh, this will give you an idea of just what you can do with the spiders. So there's a, a tree for every particular scenario if you want one. And of course, again, in the winter months, you uh, you get to enjoy the shade that these let in after, uh, you know. Chickens, uh, the cornerstone in most gardens, I have chickens and have had for all of my life and uh, I think that uh, you know anything in an edible garden really needs to have a, a rhyme or a reason I put these guys to work they don't get a free run <clears throat> I put them in a, uh, a chook tractor or chicken tractor uh, this thing that's, that I'm going to show you now is not mine obviously but um, mine's a bit more crude than that it doesn't have any wheels but you get the idea you can put these guys out into the uh, onto the lawn or garden bed, whatever the case is. If you've got no time and you can't get to the spent vegetables that need pulling out and weeding, put a chook tractor over the top of the garden bed and put put a, a bowl of water in there for the birds and go to work. And they'll pull out all of the vegetables and turn over and scratch the soil up and pull the weeds out. And uh, they'll leave you breakfast. And when you get home, all you need to do is move this along a little bit, fill up the water and go back to work again. So they do a great job. Uh, but I don't let them out in my garden. They, they get kept in a, a designated spot. Other than their, if they're in their uh, in their uh, chook tractor. <clears throat> Composting, most important uh, cornerstone again, just like chooks. I keep the compost not far from the chooks. Um, and I also grow some, uh, some food for the chickens in tubs and I take it in there some days and pull it back out. Um, so... But certainly we should be utilising what we're putting to landfill uh, and turning that into gold. 
and uh, that goes for shredded paper, cardboard, egg cartons, um, you know, all of the vacuum lint, uh, stuff out of your dryers. Um, you'd be surprised at just what you can put in there. <coughs> but in layers, um, it's just like building a, uh, a lasagna to some degree. Um, about 100 to 150 millimetres deep of low nitrogen and high nitrogen layers. Uh, the high nitrogen, obviously, are green or garden waste lawn clippings and the like. Um, the low nitrogen are dried up leaves. Could be shredded paper, twigs and sticks. Um, try and chop those bigger things up much smaller. Uh, often I have a tomahawk and a, and a chopping block beside my compost so that uh, you know, if you come along with uh, things like watermelon or something like that or pumpkin skins and the like, give them a bit of a chop up so they're nice and fine. The finer they are, the quicker they'll break down, the more you'll make and uh, the better your garden will be. And again, I don't turn it into the soil. I, I feed it from above. Think about the forest floor. It's all about feeding a forest from above. And that's what the, the forest does. It drops leaves, fruits, and so on. Uh, animals come along and they, they defecate and, and the manures go into the soils and so forth. And the composting insects come along and they take all of that down and they turn it into beautiful, rich, open, friable soil. No one needs to be turning over anything. So just feed your garden from above. And uh, when, when you're making lots and lots of compost, just broadcast it. You don't have to put big, you know, uh, uh, amounts, bucket fulls or, or wheelbarrow fulls onto your garden. Just broadcast it and water it in. And uh, if you do it often, you'll be gobsmacked at how good your soil will turn into, particularly making sure that you've got a layer of mulch over the top. You know, soil without, without mulch will become dry, hard, compact, and, and very poor soil. Uh, when, you, when you put that mulch layer on it, you're starting to, 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 to give it the forest effect. Because the mulch, it's not about just stopping the dehydration. It's about stopping the sun drying the soil out. And when, when the soil becomes warm and dry, the composting insects travel down about 200 millimetres, down deep where it's cool and moist. And in that sort of soil, you know, when you're digging down, not only is it hard to dig through, but when you get down into the, 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 the more supple, um, moister uh, you know, parts of the soil, that's where you start to see the insects. You know, so you really need to get that mulch layer up so that they come back up. And what happens is, is they're starting to feed from the mulch layer, which they will, um, you know, and, and it keeps the, the soil cooler and moister. The, these insects start to aerate the soil for you so that when you do get rain or when you water, you get penetration down where the roots of your plants are and, you, and, and it gets done properly, not, you know, we're, we're working the soil is just, I'm seriously, no one's got the time for it. Um, compost bins, compost um, um, barrels, whatever you can use to compost, you know, reused, repurposed uh, truck pallets, they're very, very easy. Uh, should it be straw? It could be anything. It could be lucerne, pea straw, um, anything that can be composted. You know, so just try where you possibly can to not put too much weed seed in there. Um, if you've got chickens, feed the weeds to the chooks. When it comes out the other end, <clears throat> the weed seeds are sterilised because they're omnivores. You put that through a, a cow, horse, sheep or other, it comes out and it still germinates. So I've got this in the mix just to remind me to tell you that bees are in trouble globally. Um, we fly billions of bees out of the country to help prop up the world's bee population due to a predatory mite called the varroa mite and a number of other diseases, some of which we have in this country, one called colony collapse disorder. Einstein says that we've only got four years left on the planet if we lose our pollinators. Now, in the highlands of China, these guys are climbing their fruit trees because it's not if it's going to happen, it already has happened. They don't have any pollinators up there because of their pollution and what they've done, um, you know, to themselves there. So, and if they don't get up there and pollinate these fruit trees, they don't get fruit. So can I urge you to give some consideration to what I've talked about tonight regarding companion planting instead of resorting to using chemical sprays, fertilisers and, uh, and, and fungicides and maybe do a bit of an audit in your garden sheds and maybe consider going down and having a chat to your local nurseryman to see uh, whether they've got, and they have got some wonderful products today that will 
uh, help you and the bees out by uh, uh, using bee-friendly products that, uh, that are about. Um, or you can use uh, um, some methods in my, uh, my book. I don't use anything I can't either drink, rub on my skin or eat on my garden. So uh, and I have a list of those sorts of sprays in my book, one of my books. Um, this is one of my beehives in the, uh, the backyard. I actually have two because my block is a fraction over 500 square metres. So I'm, I'm allowed to have two beehives, but you don't necessarily have to have a beehive to get uh, great pollination. Just think about all those companion plants. Those bees will come in, in droves if you, uh, if you provide them uh, the wherewithal to, to come in and feed. Um, the hungry, thirsty little critters, they drink up to a litre a, a day. If you've got bees coming and going from your garden, so you can't help them out, maybe a little frog bog somewhere, small pond, grow some aquatic plants over the top. Um, this is a zola, but um, don't grow this if you're near a water course. Maybe use something like water lettuce or similar. But it'll allow a platform for the bees to land comfortably, drink and, and take the water that they need, and off they go. Um, sources with stones and so forth in them still tend to, uh, to trap bees, unfortunately, or kill bees. Uh, and often the stones are too hot and it evaporates very quickly. So this is a much better solution if you can use it. Well, that's it. That's the end of my presentation. Um, again, I alluded to earlier, and I'm sure that the, uh, the, li the library has a copy of each of these books. But if you wanted to get a copy of them, you can get them at my website, craigcastry.com.au. Uh, it will go into practical guide. It's exactly that. And it has a comprehensive... Uh, chapters on all sorts of things including how to put together a wicking bed and all the do's and don'ts uh, along with companion planting um, what to plant with and what to not plant with plant profiles teaches you all about what to grow how to grow what you plant in the uh, in your in your garden um, so plant profiles does that it's a profile on over 100 different edibles um, and a simple urban life it's all about self-sufficiency. It's also a recipe book of over 40 different recipes, including um, cheese making, charcuterie, um, uh, uh, making bread, sourdough, passata, all sorts of stuff. If you go and check out the, uh, the table of contents on my website, you'll see what's in it. So um, with that, I'll, um, I'll uh, open up for some questions that I didn't get to. Hopefully I haven't got too many that I missed. Um, I should it be straw? And no, I talked about that uh, north facing yet. What aspect for the Espalier fruit trees? Um, look, provided they get between four to six hours minimum sun, you, you'll be it'll be fine. That's that's all you need. By the way, that um, thank you, uh, Tammy. But that's. It's Craig Castry, all one word, not craig.castry.com.au. But that's not, you know, that's that's fine. Um, maybe I'll, I'll put that in there so you can get to it. Craigcastry.com. .au. There you go. No worries, any suggestions for snails? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, look, I use um, pet-friendly snail bait. Um, you can get it at diggers.com.au. Um, or you can use rolled oats. Don't use too many, though. What happens is that the oats swell up inside their bellies and make them terribly sick to the point because they love it. Um, it, uh, it blows their intestines up and they tend to, uh, to move away. So don't, but don't use too many rolled oats because you'll get other problems like birds and rats. So, um, so, and you, you want to put it out um, sparingly if you possibly can. Um, do I have issues with, no, I don't. Um, when broadcasting compost, composted manure, etc. do you scrape back the compost first? You know, I think you, do you scrape back the mulch first? No. Um, broadcast it as finely as I possibly can. And, uh, and then I water it in well. So, um, so I'll get a, take a barrow full of mulch out to the garden, a barrow full of compost and a big barrow, I mean, I mean, I'll get two or three shovelfuls and I'll broadcast it over the plants, the whole, the whole lot, and then I'll water them, hose it all off down into the, so, and I'll use up that whole um, wheelbarrow full 
over the whole garden. If I've got a couple, then I do it a bit more uh, more comprehensively, maybe go out the front as well. So um, the organic solution for oxalis, yeah. <laughs> Please, unfortunately. Oxalis is a terrible blight, unfortunately. It's, it's very hard to get rid of. Apart from mulching, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's very hard to get rid of. I, I wish I had a, a solution for you. Um, another one, if you've got pets um, and you're a bit worried about snail bait, um, cut a length of pipe uh, about 30 centimetres long or a bit longer and um, put some uh, some snail bait into the bottom of it and just tip it slightly until it runs down into about the middle and sit that on the ground. And that way your pets can't get into the middle of it and um, your snails will go in there and uh, and uh, eat up the bait. Uh, try to spay them, but the possums kept eating the new growth. Any suggestions? Um, yes, there are a couple. Um, you can use uh, molasses um, sprayed uh, mixed up in water. I can't remember the the um, exact uh, mix. It's in my book. Um, sprayed over the foliage that'll keep them away. The other thing you can possibly do is make uh, a friend of your local reptile dealer and grab a hold of some bags of snake poo and poke that in the bottom of, uh, in the in the end of an old sock or stocking and tie that up where you think you're getting your uh, your possums, uh, uh, you know, where, where you think they're getting, when they're coming in, and uh, they, they, they know what that smell is and they'll stay away. Uh, same with rats and, uh, and mice. So any other questions that I can help answer? Well, I hope you've enjoyed that. Um, as I say, I'm uh, I'm back on uh, on the 25th of November, uh, talking about uh, an introduction to urban beekeeping, which is uh, I think a lot of uh, a lot of people are very interested in. So, um, if that's you, make sure you uh, you get along. Um, you have got copies of my book books at your library, haven't you, Tammy? Yes, I'm. I'm just wondering if they've been catalogued, but I will be following up on that tomorrow. So we, we will make sure we've got copies in our library collections. Um, Craig, thank you for such a wonderful talk. I can't speak for everyone, but I really enjoyed, I really it. enjoyed it. You've got so You've many. Got so many. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. Not sure why. Not sure why but thank, thank, you thank you very you much. No worries. No worries. If you just unmute yourself now again, Tammy, that should help. How's that? Yeah. Yes, yeah, that that's better. Better. So, sorry about the echoes, everyone. It was a terrific talk, Craig. Um, very practical, inspiring ideas. I'd love to um, live at your house. It must <laughs> be such a pleasure to walk out into your garden and, and pick what you feel like. Um, yeah, look, it is. It's, it's a different way of life. There's no two ways about that, both front and back. And it's Everyone can do it. It's, this isn't this isn't hard to do. It's oh, I just think you know, we all need to, to rethink our gardens. You know, we, we 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 spend so much money on our blocks of land and we don't use it properly. And and I don't have you know I, I don't work out there very much. I can tell you, I spend those five minutes or a bit more each day planting one or two things. That's it. And I'll pull out a couple of weeds maybe while I'm there. And every so often I'll get out there and do a bit more, but. But it's it's not that hard, and you know things like fruit trees and the like, you know, uh, grown the way I grow them, kept reasonably low so that you can easily put nets over them. You can easily pick. You're not having to get up on ladders, and you got to spray. They're easy. You know, it, it's just it makes so much sense. It really does. And and I, I I just I can't go back to eating from stuff from the supermarkets any longer. It's it's flavourless. You know, I don't know what they've sprayed on it, how it's been grown, what they've fed it with, how far it's travelled, when it was picked. I, I, I can't find out the answer to any of those questions. And we spend a fortune each week um, throwing out half of what we buy because it's close to spoil when you get it. You know, so I, I, it's just, you know, look, we, we've got to change our ways, I'm afraid. And, and, um, and we can do it. We don't need you know, uh, big blocks. We don't need a great big vegetable garden. We don't need all this 
expert knowledge. That's that's not the case. And um, you know, look, I, I, that book, Edible Gardens of Practical God, has been reprinted. You know, if someone had to told me five years ago or six years ago when I when when I was asked to write that book, um, that it would have been reprinted. You know, we, we've sold over thirty thousand copies of that. Mm. That's, that's and I'm still, and to this day, I'm still reprinting it on a, on a, on a, you know, every couple of months, I'm getting more copies printed because it's, and the accolades of people sort of telling us, you know, that that it's changed their life. You know, it's that's that's heartwarming to me. It's 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 a wonderful thing, and and, and knowing that, um, how easy it is. You know, we, we live by it. You know, so. And I'm not a greenie by any means. I and mean, if I have to spray, I have to spray, you know, but uh, I try not to. And as I say, in the last 10 years, I can only think of maybe one occasion where um, where I've had to spray something I didn't really want to spray. But, uh, you know, so uh, it, 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 the ecosystem itself looks after itself. There are no pests in nature. So, Thank, uh, thank you so much, Craig. I think you've given us all a lot of food for thought. Um, just like to let everyone know, we were hoping to have a number of live events with Craig, which we had scheduled at various libraries and branches. Um, we weren't able to go ahead with that, but I think um, Craig's done a wonderful job with a Zoom presentation. He's reasonably local, living in Werribee, so we will hope to get him back regularly for various topics um, because we would like to change our lives in that way too, Craig. So. Thank you very much. I, I will um, end the session now and let everyone go and have their tea, including you, Craig. Thank you very much <laughs> for a wonderful no session. All See the best you. until Bye. next time. Bye for now.